the two strange beings, staring out at one another from across the temperate grassland, were evolutionary cousins, both descendants of the long-extinct progenitor race of Homo sapiens primivus. Ironically, only the least human of the pair was aware of that. His name was Telandros, though he normally neither spoke nor thought in a phonetic language. The only parts of him that were biological were a brain more than thrice the size of an ordinary human's, and some auxiliary tissues, and these cells were comprised of synthetic XNA helixes that were vastly more complex and information dense than DNA or RNA. Perpetually self-correcting and self-optimizing, both his psyche and flesh had persevered for thousands of millennia and could easily survive for thousands more. The rest of his body was a polymorphic biomechanoid made of nigh-indestructible exotic matter, currently configured into the relatively traditional form of a four-limbed theropod. His exterior was covered in a coat of iridescent, silvery filaments, each one fully prehensile and fractally branching off into smaller prehensile filaments, going all the way down to the molecular level. His large brain and other essential components were soundly secured within his ellipsoid torso, allowing his head, which was actually just the end of his forwards-facing tentacle, to be dedicated solely to an array of sensory apparatuses. His face was composed of a rotatable, dilatable ring of six elliptical eyes, with multiple sets of air intake valves that were able to analyze the local atmosphere. His forelimbs, which moments ago he had used as wings to soar across the sky, were now a sprawling mangle of branching tentacles, whereas his hind limbs were held together much more tightly to serve as legs. His tail, though currently only being used for counterbalance, could be repurposed into a third leg or extra arm in a jiffy if he needed it. Mighty post-human though he was, much like an ordinary human, Talandros couldn't actually recall the early years of his life. Superfluous information was routinely condensed and pruned, and at some point over the eons, his creation and nascent existence had been reduced to mere declarative memory, as impersonal as anything else in his mental encyclopedia. While he had never been to Earth before, he knew that his ship, the Fornostica, had originated in Seoul. His crewmates had been star hopping from one solar system to the next, spending decades to centuries studying each one before moving on at near light speed. Eventually, they had circumnavigated the entire galaxy and returned to Sol. They were first greeted by the Star Sirens, a very ancient race of microgravity-adapted transhumans that were said to date back nearly to the beginning of humanity's expansion into outer space. Conservative even by immortal standards, they had changed little in all the time that the four Gnostica had been gone. Like sharks and crocodilians, the Star Sirens viewed themselves as already perfect and beyond any need to evolve further. While a race of early transhumans that was still counted among the genus Homo may have seemed primitive to Talandros, they were still the most numerous race in Sol or any other star system with a permanent human presence, and all must yield to their authority as mistresses of the skies. Their success was a testament to the importance of initial conditions in the history of spacefaring civilizations. Had Talandros' race come first, they would have easily outcompeted the Star Sirens before they could have gained a foothold in the cosmos. But the Star Sirens had capitalized on their first mover advantage, and now the mermaids the ancient bioengineers had turned loose would rule the stars forevermore. It had been the Star Sirens who had given Talandros, along with his ship and crew, their phonetic names. They were also, incidentally, the reason he was now called a he at all. Talandros, of course, had no sex chromosomes, no reproductive organs, and no psychological or social gender. But, to the Star Sirens, all men 
were foreigners. And at some point in their culture's history, all foreigners had become men by default. So that's what they put on his visa. While the Star Sirens may have treated the crew of the Four Nostica as coldly as they would any outsiders, they escorted them to Mars without a fuss, where they were treated to a much warmer welcome. Talandros had been delighted to find that Mars was now a sprawling ecumenopolis. In the low gravity and thin atmosphere, pressurized skyscrapers made of imperishable materials that averaged over a thousand stories high had gradually accumulated to the point that they now blanketed the once red planet and housed trillions of sapient beings. It was so vast that the planet's average temperature was kept above freezing simply by the city's waste heat. Hundreds of thousands of terawatts beamed to them from the Dyson swarm of solar collectors that had once been Mercury. The Martians themselves were much like Talandros' own people. A well-ordered technady of demigodly, post-humans with a Saganian love of science and reason. They welcomed them home as prodigal sons, eager to learn of their long expedition and celebrate their courage and scientific spirit. Talandros happily spent his first few hundred days on Mars, telepathically exchanging higher dimensional semantic graphs with the hyper-intellectual elites or soaring amongst the literal skyscrapers through the rarefied atmosphere. He didn't dare to dive too deep, however, for the fetid abyssal depths were long neglected and were perilous for civilized beings to explore. While Mars may now have been the heart of human civilization, the Earth would always be its cradle. Though Talandros fully intended to spend the bulk of his planned centuries in Seoul on Mars, when the planet once again came into alignment with Earth, he decided to spend the next couple of years paying it a visit. Earth was a strange planet, though. In fairness, it always had been. History that bordered on legend said that the first humans had once reached a population of around 10 billion, but over centuries and millennia of low birth rates and high emigration to the exponentially growing numbers of idyllic centrifugal space habitats or Venusian cloud cities, the population eventually fell to under 2 billion and remained there. Most of Earth was a nature preserve, its climate and ecology now ironically kept in an unnatural stasis by its sapient population, who lived minimally disruptive lives either in self-sufficient city-states or rural homesteads. The post-humans of Mars had not spoken highly of the locals, considering the, relatively, near-baseline transhumans who required an intact ecosystem to survive and prosper to be a little different from the rest of the wildlife. To them, Earth was an undeveloped backwater and kept so by a sense of posterity and sentimentality that their utilitarian minds found difficult to comprehend. Talandros, however, had found the Earth folk eccentrically diverse in body and mind, a pleasant change from the insufferably homogenous and conformist star sirens he first met. Though they were simple by his standards, they at least didn't think of him as a god or demon as some primitive aliens he had encountered on his travels had, and he generally found them accepting and helpful. The vast nature preserves he visited were not completely unpeopled, but were home to indigenous tribes of techno-primitivists. One such tribe of genetically engineered goliathans roamed the plains and woodlands, herding mammoths and terror birds, eschewing any technology other than what they could make with their own hands, or the nanite symbiotes in their bodies. The men stood over eight feet tall and had strength enough to deadlift several tons, and feared not even the most ferocious of beasts. They were noble savages who used their superhuman intellects solely to philosophically justify their lives as noble savages, and Telandros had found them even more insufferably self-righteous than the Star Sirens. But the being in front of him now was not one of the techno-primitivists. It was simply a primitive. The creature was slight of build, though its torso was pear-shaped with strong gluteal muscles 
and stood upon three-toed digitigrade feet. It was only about half as tall as the Goliathan men, but seemed unlikely to be a pygmy relative. However, its dusty blue skin and silvery white hair were enough to mark it as a genetically modified being, even if that modification had occurred countless generations ago. It possessed pointed, articulated ears held high in attention, and its large cat-like eyes glowed with a soft eye shine in the evening light. It curiously sniffed the air with a large nose, which, when combined with its enlarged upper lip, gave it a noticeably rodent-like appearance. Most curiously of all, the thick, badger-like claws on its hands suggested that they were intended for digging, not tool use. A quick analysis of the DNA particles floating in the air confirmed Talandros's suspicion that the creature did, in fact, belong to the genus Homo. But a scan of its anatomy revealed its brain to be around 700 cubic centimeters in size, twice the size of an average chimps, but barely half that of a baseline human. Was this a species of human that had been engineered for lower intelligence to the point of being subsapient? An utterly nihilistic and misanthropic concept to be sure, but Talandros couldn't deny that the results were at least scientifically interesting. The creature let out a high-pitched yipping sound, and several others of his kin cautiously poked their heads out from over the tall grasses to examine the strange, shiny terror bird that was trespassing in their territory. One of the females had a miniature version of the creatures riding upon her back, one with a sloth-like body plan and disproportionately large head and ears, its long claws interlocking upon her clavicle. Talandros naturally assumed that it was an infant and didn't bother to examine it any closer. Instead, he checked the up-to-date encyclopedia he had downloaded for any information it might have on the strange beings. He immediately found that they had been given the seemingly endearing name of Nolings, and were descendants of some of the earliest eco-sapiens. These had been primitivists who had opted for genetic modifications to minimize their ecological footprints. Unlike the Goliathans, who had prioritized their own survival and well-being when redesigning their bodies for a Stone Age lifestyle, the eco-sapiens had wanted to have as little impact on the natural environment as possible. This meant not only making themselves smaller, but altruistic enough that they would willingly endure the sacrifices their lifestyle demanded of them for the benefit of an abstract concept of nature that they could never consciously appreciate. Their altruism eventually led to them becoming completely eusocial, and their utter dependence on their tribe along with the demands for conformity, had actively selected against high intelligence. Electively cut off from civilization, they were at the mercy of natural selection, and over the eons, their full sapience had been lost. Tragic, but at least not atrocious, Talandros thought. He saw in his encyclopedia that they did still possess a simple language with a few hundred short words, which they would compound together when that vocabulary proved inadequate. The precise and information-dense phonetic languages of the other transhumans Tel Andros had met already seemed like oversimplified baby talk to him, but he supposed he could give this a shot as well. He carefully constructed the simplest semantic graph in his mind that still conveyed what he wanted, and vocalized it into the Noling's language. Hoot. Good hoot. Very good hoot at sunby. Am farman. Farman go very far in black sky. Farman go all around big star family and see very many stars. Farman come home after big time. Farman like new things. You new things to farman. Trade stories with farman. Hoot. The Nolings stared silently at him for a moment, before exchanging confused glances with one another. They had never heard a terror bird talk before, 
he assumed, but they also lack the intellectual capacity to be astonished by such a thing. What? The first of them finally barked back. Talandros hung his head in resignation. Productive communication between himself and the Nullings was likely not possible, as he wondered if one of the Goliathans might be able to serve as an interpreter between them. The baby babbled something that he didn't bother to translate. His packmates, however, heeded the command, and all turned their backs to Talandros in unison, dropping to all fours and scampering off through the tall grass. Not wanting to let this unexpected opportunity pass him by, Talandro sprinted off after them in pursuit. He switched his focus to his infrared vision so as not to lose them in the grass, though they proved to be not much warmer than the surrounding environment. Keeping his distance and stooping well below the grass so as not to alarm them, he ran along the ground as silently as an owl in flight. He watched as the Nolings all formed into a single file, then disappeared down a large tunnel into the earth. This was no doubt the warren that they had dug with their own claws, and according to his encyclopedia, there would be dozens to hundreds of Nolings spread throughout an extensive network of tunnels and chambers. Talandros retracted his limbs and elongated his torso to adopt a more weasel-like profile and slunk down the tunnel, eager to see the great knoll hole for himself. He had been prepared to use his infrared and sonar sensors to view the warren, but to his surprise, he saw a glimmer of blue light twinkling just up ahead. Upon closer inspection, he saw that it was a log with large bioluminescent mushroom caps growing out of it, its placement suggesting that the Nolings were using it as a lamp. The regular placement of other such mushroom logs throughout the tunnel seemed to confirm this hypothesis, and soon Talandros came upon a chamber that was completely awash in the soft blue glow. Peeking his head inside, Talandros saw an immense and orderly stockpile of the logs alongside storage niches filled with picked mushroom caps by themselves. He realized that the Nolings must have been farming the mushrooms for food and light, and most likely, the shiny beetles he saw feeding on the rotting wood as well. This was likely a holdover from their eco-sapien days, and it made him wonder what other more complex behaviors these lowly creatures might still retain. A pair of Nolings in the chamber spotted him immediately and began yipping, a warning cry that was echoed by a hundred other voices throughout the warren as they dashed off down another tunnel. Talandros could tell that they were heading towards some kind of large, central chamber, something he was determined to see with his own eyes before returning to the surface. Swiftly, he pulled himself along like some lizard chasing burrowing rodents, or at least that's surely how he seemed to the Nolings. Soon the tunnel ended, dropping him into a vast subterranean cavern that had been dug out by claw generation by generation. A shaft of crepuscular light beamed down from the surface through a ventilation chimney, beneath which lay a hand-dug well that provided the Nolings with their water and a hearth they kept for fire. Dozens of the Nolings had assembled in the central chamber, and all had gathered around a singular, venerated figure, their queen. She wasn't hard to spot, being not only larger than the others, but taller as well, nearly as tall as a baseline human woman. It seemed that most of the Nolings were neotenic, never experiencing full puberty unless selected to breed. Only one female could breed at a time, and she dedicated herself fully to the responsibility. She was surrounded by a harem of several breeding males and wet nurses who cared for the offspring she produced. The entire colony hissed and screeched at Talandros, trying to drive him off. One male, 
armed with a flint hand axe virtually indistinguishable from one his Homo habilis forebearers might have used, leaped towards Talandros and struck him with it. The stone shattered to pieces, leaving his hand bleeding and Talandros utterly unscathed. Two more males tried attacking him in this manner and experienced identical results. The cries of the Nolings became increasingly panicked at this development, while Talandros remained utterly unperturbed. His attention was instead on one of the wet nurses, and the infant suckling at her teat, an infant that did not look like the small being he had seen earlier. Puzzled, he surveyed the central chamber in its entirety, eventually spotting three of the large-headed, large-eared little ones seated in a circle of mushrooms that sprouted directly from the ground rather than from a log. All three were looking at him with a keen gaze that seemed more acute than what a gnawling should be capable of, let alone an infant. Checking his encyclopedia once again, Talandros was startled to find that these small members of the Warren weren't infants or even juveniles, but rather shamans of the Gaia trees. The Gaia trees were plants that had been engineered to be biological server hubs and communicated with each other and more traditional internet cables through genetically modified and nanotech-enhanced mycelial networks. The mycelium also allowed them to communicate with the roots of other plants, shepherding their behavior and continuously managing and optimizing the world's biosphere. While this network was technically just a subset of the multi-layered new sphere that enveloped the Earth, the techno-primitivists revered the Gaian Overmind as their goddess. The Goliathan shamans were confident in their ability to interpret omens from her, but as far as Talandros had been able to tell, it was all superstitious nonsense. But this was different. The fairy ring that contained the Noling shamans was unquestionably an outgrowth of the Gaian mycelial network. Their luminescence waxed and waned in a deliberate pattern, and when the shamans placed their palms upon the mushroom caps, Talandros could detect electrochemical signals being exchanged between them. He realized then that he had been wrong about these simple people. They had not sacrificed sapience and civilization to an abstract and indifferent concept of nature, but rather to an eco-technological embodiment of her, and it was a sacrifice that had not gone unappreciated. The Gaian Overmind had shepherded these people's evolution, sparing the intellect of the shaman caste so that they would have someone able to interpret her will for them, even if most of them had the minds of toddlers. Rationality and intelligence were never what their ancestors had truly valued about being human. Living as harmoniously as possible with nature and one another was what the eco-sapiens of old had valued above all else and that was what their descendants now had. And there was nothing tragic about that at all, he realized. Good hoot, far man. One of the shamans greeted him in a high-pitched voice, the rest of the warren falling silent at the sound of his revered voice. Big man's no come to Knoll Hole, but you strange man. You know no good ways. You dummy dumb. But Gaia say you spoke true of flying through stars. Stars very high, but very small. Gaia big, far man. Gaia protects Nolings. Leave Knoll Hole, and we forgive bad ways. Stay, and Gaia curse you. All things Gaia touches will be far man enemies. Choose now. Far man. Though it amused him that the Nolings thought of him as stupid, given his earlier botched attempt at oral communication, he decided that it was better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open his mouth and prove it. Instead, he placed his left forelimb onto a nearby log and extended his microscopic manipulators into the dead wood to draw out the carbon. Holding his forelimb high for all to see, he rapidly began assembling the carbon molecules into a stylized diamond figure of their sacred mushrooms. He intentionally designed its lattice to make it phosphorescent, so that it would always glow with the same light as the real things. 
When the idol was complete and still hot in his hand, he delicately placed it within the fairy ring for the shamans to examine. While the other Nolings, even the queen, gawked on in fear and wonder, the shamans knew through their bond with the Gaian Overmind that such a thing was not only possible, but common among the civilized peoples. Each shaman inspected the offering one by one and, in turn, nodded their approval. His peace offering accepted and his curse averted, Telandros bowed graciously before shooting up the chimney overhead. Launching himself straight into the air, he resumed his aerial theropod form and continued soaring across the grasslands. He meant now to study the Gaian Overmind in more detail, eager to discover what other unexpected interactions it might have with the ecosystem and its people. Earth truly was a strange planet. But in all fairness, it always had been. <laughs>